Adhikarna 5. The path leads to the conditioned Brahman. Sutra 7. Karyang Bhararirasya Gatyupapate Badari. Badari thinks that the souls are led. Kayai to the conditioned Brahman. Gati Upapatehe, because of the possibility of becoming the goal. Asya, on its part. Translation. Badari thinks that the souls are led to the conditioned Brahman, for it alone can reasonably be the goal. Doubt. With regard to the text, he escorts them to Brahman, Chandogya 4.15.5. The point to be considered is whether this deity escorts them to the inferior conditioned Brahman or to the superior unconditioned Brahman itself. Why should such a doubt arise? On account of the use of the word Brahman and the Upanishadic mention of progress. Badari. As to that, the teacher Badri thinks that they are led to the inferior, conditioned, and qualified Brahman alone. Why? For it can logically be the goal. For this conditioned Brahman can properly be a goal to be reached, since it has a locus. But with regard to the supreme Brahman, there can be no such conceptions as an approacher, a goal, and progress towards it. For the Absolute Brahman is omnipresent and is also the inmost self of the travelers. Sutra 8 Visheshi Tattvacha Translation And the conditioned Brahman must be the goal owing to the specific mention of this. Since in another Upanishadic text a specific statement is made thus, then a being created from the mind of Brahman, that is, Hiranyagarbha, comes and conducts them to the worlds of Brahman. They attain perfection and live in these worlds of Brahman for a great many superfine years. Brihararanyaka 6 to 15. Therefore, it can be understood that the path is related to the conditioned Brahman only, for it is improper to use the plural number in worlds in the case of the supreme Brahman whereas this plural number quite befits the conditioned Brahman, since there can be such a thing as difference of states in it. Even the Upanishadic use of the word world, constituting a place of experience with its multiple aspects, fits in well with a conditioned entity, whereas in the other case of the absolute Brahman, the word can be used only in a figurative sense, as in such texts, O Emperor, this is Brahmaloka, the world that is Brahman itself. Brihadaranyaka 4.4.23 Again, to speak in terms of a container and a thing contained, as in, in those worlds of Brahman, hardly fits in with the supreme Brahman. Hence, this escorting relates to the conditioned Brahman alone. Opponent the word Brahman cannot be used even for the conditioned Brahman, inasmuch as it was established earlier in the first chapter that Brahman is the cause of the origin, etc., of the whole universe. Sutra 111. Vedantin. As to that, the answer is Sutra 9. Samipya tu tadvyapadeshaha tu but. Tat-vyava-padeshaha, the designation as such. Shamipyat is owing to nearness. Translation, but the conditioned Brahman has that designation owing to nearness to the absolute Brahman. The word but is used for removing the objection. Since the inferior Brahman is very close to the supreme Brahman, the use of the word Brahman with regard to the former creates no difficulty. The established practice is that the Supreme Brahman itself 
is called the inferior Brahman, when it is conditioned by the pure adjuncts and is taught as though possessed of the attributes of being identified with the mind and such other features of creation for the sake of meditation by some aspirants under certain circumstances. Namaste. So this Adhikarna, this topic in Brahma Sutra is quite extensive. It's like 14 pages in the original text. So we're going to break it up into seven parts. And even then, some of the videos are going to be a bit longer than normal. <laughs> That's okay. Only the serious students are watching them to the end anyway. The average view is something like five or six minutes. <laughs> so they don't really get even to the part where we start talking. <laughs> they give up midway through the text. But, oh, well, you know, that's they have tiny attention spans. So what can we do about that? The issue here is when the enlightened soul quits the body, and goes along the path to Brahman, conducted by one of these deities, or several deities, it's not clear exactly what, is he going to the unconditioned Brahman, the absolute Brahman, or the relative Brahman, conditioned Brahman, secondary Brahman? And Badari, Badarayana, the author of these sutras, is saying that he's going to the conditioned Brahman because it is called in the sutras the world of Brahman. And to have a world, you have to have differences. You have to have qualities, space, time, objects, activities, and so on. And all these things are conspicuous by their absence in the unconditioned Brahman, absolute Brahman, Nirguna Brahman. Therefore, he must be going to the Saguna Brahman, the qualified, relative, full of qualities Brahman. So the reason this is an issue and is discussed so extensively by Shankaracharya, is that the previous description of the soul leaving the body and going along the path is interpreted by most commentators on the Brahma Sutra as going to the unqualified Brahman. And that the discussion about him going to the qualified Brahman is something made up by the opponent. But Shankaracharya says, no, no. The original meaning of the sutras is that these realized souls have maybe a little bit of false ego left. And so they go to the qualified Brahman for the final purification. And they live there until the end of the universe, and then they go to the unqualified Brahman. They merge into the Nirguna Brahman. So somebody might be saying, well, what's the big deal? Nirguna or Saguna Brahman, it's all Brahman. It's all the absolute. It's all the supreme. And we say, yes, that's true. But of course, you know, the philosophers like to argue, they like to debate, they like to have all kinds of issues that they can bring up and, you know, beat you over the head with. <laughs> but we don't think that this is real. We don't accept this. We say that to understand Brahma Sutra as it is, one has to take the direct meaning of the sutras and that direct meaning is revealed by Shankara because of his deep understanding and realization and his 
encyclopedic knowledge of the Vedic literatures, especially the Upanishads, that he knows because he can quote from anywhere. He can pull these quotes, you know, out of thin air, apparently. But if you go and research, if you take, for example, the quotes that he posts in his commentary, and you go back and look at the whole chapter that they come from, it's really clear what's meant. So we shouldn't get hung up on these back and forth arguments and stuff like this. But we should take these discussions as kind of a, a primer or coaching on the kinds of arguments that believers in other philosophies, other interpretations are going to bring up when we try to discuss our views. So when I say we and us and our, I mean the followers of Shankaracharya. Shankara, as far as my research shows, is the preeminent interpreter of the Brahma Sutras and the Upanishads. So whatever he says, you know, <laughs> if you go and you dig up all the quotes and look into their context and background, you find that he's always right. And that these other philosophers are making mountains out of molehills and basically trying to base arguments on a narrow context or a narrow interpretation of the context. Whereas Shankaracharya is looking at the big picture, the whole Vedic literature, and the complete Upanishads. What a mind in such a young body. It's really amazing. He left this world when he was only 32 years old. So that means all this wonderful literature that he created was done you know, from the time of being 16 years old or so. Just amazing. So Shankara is our hero. <laughs> He's our fearless leader. And we're following him because in our experience, we cannot find any fault in his teachings. And great souls like Ramana Maharshi, and Shekhar Indra Saraswati, Mahaparyavar, all agree. Shankaracharya is the main teacher of Vedanta, the conclusions of the Vedas. So we do ourselves a disservice if we entertain all these different conflicting arguments, because he is giving the authorized or the original purport of the Vedas. Now, we will see in the following sections many different arguments against this conclusion. But why we should go into this, why should we give our attention and time to understanding all these arguments? Because these are exactly the arguments of the conflicting schools that they will bring up to us when we try to express our views. So to prepare us for the different kind of arguments that will be raised and the means of counteracting them, Shankara is showing us the real meaning of these sutras. And so as we go into this deep, long adhikarna, try to keep this in mind. Try to keep it in the background so that you don't Number one, become confused, or number two, become tired of all this back and forth and, you know, give up the study or something like that. This is very essential for all students of Vedanta, for all the followers of Shankaracharya, because it leads to the final conclusion, which is complete realization of Nirguna Brahman. Aung Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum Aum Namah Shivaya <laughs>